The analysis of losses from recent conflicts shows that more than a full 20% of military casualties were not sustained as a result of combat, but were caused by accidents. These accidents were mostly preventable, and therefore the resulting losses were quite unnecessary. Land Forces Command has implemented a field safety program to help prevent accidents and reduce unnecessary human and material losses during field deployments and operations. The standard operating procedures incorporated in the program contain specific guidance for the planning of field exercises and operations. They are especially useful for administrative movements and living routines under field conditions. As the Land Force Command Order points out, the implementation of the field safety program is a chain of command responsibility and its effectiveness can only be achieved through the leadership and support of leaders at all levels. So individuals must assume responsibility for their own safety and leaders must ensure that field procedures and standards are observed to the letter. The concept of force protection, preserving the fighting integrity of a force, is a basic part of modern military doctrine. It means that commanders must preserve their troops and their material at all costs, if they want to engage the enemy with a fighting organization at full strength and on terms of their own choosing. And you can argue this can be accomplished in three ways. First, a very careful study of the ground enables a commander to use maximum concealment and deception to make friendly forces difficult to locate and attack. Second, fit and healthy soldiers with adequate weapons and material will be able to fight in all types of weather and terrain. The third and equally important aspect of force protection is safety. If proper safety procedures are neglected, the integrity of a force will be compromised and its ability to fight and win will be reduced. Clearly, a soldier ceases to be an asset to the unit when he is hurt or killed. Whether this happens in battle or because of an accident such as, say, jumping off a vehicle, in the end the result is the same. Whether by enemy action or a lapse in safety procedures, the injured soldier becomes a burden to his commander and comrades because resources now have to be diverted from the overall effort to look after him. What's more, he ceases to be a member of the team and can play no further part in the attainment of the objective. It all adds up. Casualties put added strains on supporting troops and tie-up vehicles, aircraft, field hospitals, and other facilities. As members of the total force, we combine our diverse skills to form an effective team capable of facing all types of challenges. We have a professional obligation to protect the integrity of this team by making safety a part of everything we do. Safety consciousness becomes especially critical during field exercises. That's when extra demands are placed upon soldiers because of the difficulties in living and training under harsh conditions. Of course, safety requirements must not interfere unduly with realism in training. But at the same time, it must be remembered that a good soldier is a well-trained and healthy soldier. Leaders at every echelon must practice risk assessment when they prepare to go to the field. In fact, everyone should have safety uppermost in their minds, even as they load their equipment and leave their base en route to the exercise area. It can't start too soon. Ample guidance is available in LFC orders to help leaders prepare themselves and their troops for deployments in the field. Now is a good time to review safety procedures. Remember that field exercises offer lots of opportunities for accidents. In fact, it's been calculated that someone living and working in the field is up to five times more likely to have an accident than someone in garrison. So the protection of force integrity through safety begins with leaders at all levels, making sure that each and every soldier observes proper safety procedures in everything they do.
A safety officer must be appointed for every deployment in the field. On larger concentrations, the safety officer is a member of the G1 personnel planning staff. This officer plans and carries out safety inspections, gathers information about any accidents that have occurred, identifies trends, and forms recommendations to eliminate dangerous situations or practices. As soon as possible after the arrival of troops, the GSO will make a thorough inspection of the bivouac area. A detailed report will be prepared immediately, describing the hazards that have been discovered and the corrective measures that are necessary to neutralize them. Follow-up inspections will make sure that these have been implemented. A set of unfamiliar conditions prevails in the field. Normal safety systems that most people take for granted just don't operate here. You see, accident prevention is as much a frame of mind as the application of stringent standards. Young soldiers should always be reminded of the need to develop a keen sense of awareness about safety. That's why the GSO and other leaders will carry out many unscheduled safety inspections. Their purpose is to make sure that living and working conditions in the bivouac do not present unnecessary risks. A big danger is personal disorientation. Out here it can be wet, cold and uncomfortable. Meal times can be irregular, to say the least. People are deprived of their personal comforts, their normal routines. An uncomfortable soldier will try and make him or herself less uncomfortable, sometimes even at the expense of safety. Another problem is the myth of invincibility that is felt by some soldiers, especially the more inexperienced ones. They think that because they're wearing combat clothing, eating out of cans and sleeping under canvas, nothing can hurt them. Wrong. Lots can hurt them, and they stand the greatest risk when they fear the least. Here's a classic. This guy thinks it's cool to jump down from a vehicle. He soon learns otherwise. The safe way to mount or dismount a vehicle is to use three points of contact. One, two, three. And it's a good idea to use the hatches whenever possible. That's what they're designed for. Being a tough guy can lead to grief, both for the individual and for his fellow soldiers. Cutting wood for a fire, working with vehicles, cleaning weapons, fording rivers, carrying packs, moving and lifting heavy objects, the list of hazardous actions that can lead to injury through over-enthusiasm or just showing off is practically endless. Nobody wants to kill motivation, but unnecessary injuries and deaths must be minimized. There's a difference between being motivated and believing that nothing can harm you. Junior leaders should make sure that soldiers aren't tackling tasks in ways that compromise health and safety. Over-ambitious objectives and unrealistic expectations can put pressure on well-motivated young soldiers to perform. This sometimes leads the soldiers to disobey standard operating procedures, ignore safety standards, and take silly risks. Make sure that the exercise is well planned Soldiers participating in the exercise should be adequately trained for the tasks they are asked to perform. Some soldiers are fond of wearing items of jewelry, but each piece of jewelry represents one more hazardous item you carry around with you. What would happen to this soldier's finger, for example, if his ring got caught on something just as he dismounted from this M109 self-propelled howitzer? Items like neck chains, earrings, and bracelets getting caught up in tools, machinery, electrical wiring, and other equipment lead to all kinds of nasty injuries. Injuries that can take soldiers out of action. They become liabilities to the force rather than assets. Don't wear them. Fatigue, even to the point of exhaustion, is among the chief causes of accidents on exercises. This in itself is not surprising as tasks and activities are scheduled at all hours of the day and night. After all, the enemy doesn't keep office hours in active theaters. 
but leaders must make sure that fatigue is taken into account in all their planning and activities. It's a good idea, for example, to make sure that drivers are the first to get their heads down and the last to be shaken. Driving armored personnel carriers and other tracked vehicles requires skill and concentration. Troops might easily have to move under blackout conditions in bad weather when visibility is reduced to practically nothing. This is when you need a driver who is alert and well rested. And always make sure that there are full working communications between the commander and the driver on every vehicle. A soldier will lie down and sleep pretty well anywhere if he or she is tired enough. Like the side of a road where a column of tanks is liable to come down at any minute, or near a vehicle marshalling area like this harbor. Don't lie down anywhere there's a possibility you might get run over. Take the time to scope the area and find a secure place to rest in the space between four trees, for example, is ideal. Another basic principle of field operations is always use equipment that's designed for the job and never bring personal kit to the field. Military equipment is designed and built to military specifications. Usually it will perform to expected standards and in predictable ways. If it has to be fixed, people have been trained to fix it and are familiar with the model or type. Personal kit is asking for trouble. This barbecue, for example, shouldn't have been allowed anywhere near the exercise area. Look how close it is to the tents, and the hot coals just give everyone another thing to worry about. Another example is these red plastic jerry cans. These are very hazardous. They're not as strong as the jerry cans issued and used by the Canadian forces. In a low-speed collision, for example, plastic cans might easily rupture, while the standard jerry cans will stay intact. A modern army runs on electrical power, power for everything from lights and radios to computers and electronic warfare countermeasures. Portable and towable generators produce that power, but sometimes a sufficient number aren't available from army stores and leaders must arrange for supplementary generators from commercial sources. Make sure these meet minimum military specifications. Check for basic safety aspects like tire wear and the condition of the axle, the springs, and the tow bar assembly. If it's an unfamiliar type or model, make sure that an operator's manual is supplied along with the unit and study it carefully. When you're setting up the generator, level it and ground it properly. These units can generate intense electrical current and deliver lethal shocks if they're connected improperly. Be particularly careful if there's been rain recently and it's wet underfoot. The area surrounding the generator should be kept clear too. It's just common sense to keep flammable materials well away. They don't mix well with electricity. There's all kinds of risks in the bivouac. Electricity connectors, junction boxes, wires, and lots of gasoline and other flammable liquids too. Safety procedures are absolutely critical around these hazardous materials. In the tent area, leaders must always be alert to a variety of potential hazards. Make regular inspections with these in mind. Look at this, for example. Some guy's trying to dry out his towel by hanging it up next to an unshielded light bulb. He obviously doesn't realize that the average tent fire lasts about a minute. After that, there's nothing much left to burn. There have been unfortunate incidents in the past when soldiers have burned to death in tent fires. They haven't even had time to get out of their sleeping bags. So don't take chances like this inside a tent. Follow procedures when using these immersion heaters. They're basic and solid and will perform for many years. But they must be set up and operated safely.
tents should be sited properly too. Fire in one tent can spread easily to the next if they're placed too close together. And obviously the field kitchen, with all its particular hazards, shouldn't be anywhere near the accommodation tents. Sight the kitchen at least 15 meters from the nearest tent. Accidents that involve injuries must be reported. Those that cause material losses, and which will become the subject of a service investigation, must also be reported. Information from all these reports goes into a central data bank called the General Safety Accident Information System. Subsequent data analysis enables GSOs to identify trends in the factors that cause accidents. This lets them advise commanders on methods and practices that can be taken to reduce accidents even further. It is one of the junior leader's primary responsibilities to protect the integrity of the force by observing proper safety procedures. The whole point of this is so that the force will avoid unnecessary losses and be able to conduct operations at maximum effectiveness. Make sure that everyone understands this. Survival is everything. Let's not do the enemy's job for him. <laughs>